Good morning. I'm Aaron Mitchell, the associate pastor at Berean Baptist Church, and we'd like to welcome you to our Resurrection Sunday uh, Sunday School class. Um, <clears throat> keeping in step, we're late like I usually am from time to time. So um, most of you who attend here on Sunday morning are used to that by now. Um, but we can't blame traffic, right? Because nobody's on the road. Um, but we'd like to, yeah, my wife brought up a really good point this morning, um, speaking on the term Resurrection Sunday or Happy Easter. Um, I feel like there's a lot of people who have lost the meaning of what Resurrection Sunday really is or what the meaning of Easter is. Um, so hopefully by the end of the studies today, you'll have a better grasp of it. But these are things we also need to hand down and pass to the younger generations because the younger generations today have lost their way and have lost their sight on what Easter really is. It's not bunnies, eggs, and uh, ham, even though those things are all good and fun to participate in as a family. But there's more to it. So if you would, please, uh, we're going to begin our Bible study this morning out of Matthew chapter number seven, Matthew chapter number seven. Um, we were there for the last Sunday school class, but I'm going to approach this a little bit differently this morning out of Matthew chapter number seven. There's a few verses that we're going to read out of Matthew chapter number seven, starting in verse Number 24, the Bible reads, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Verse 28, And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Let's pray this morning. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that it would be your words this morning, that it would be your Holy Spirit. Lord, I believe this is the message or lesson you had me prepare this morning to strengthen the people of God. Lord, I ask that you would strengthen our hearts, our minds, our resolve. Lord, help us to learn more from your word. Lord, to strengthen our faith. Lord, I ask now that your Holy Spirit would move across the world this morning that people would understand what Resurrection Sunday really is and that we would teach our young people as well. Lord, I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to start this morning the lesson noticing that there are two types of people here this morning in this passage. One who builds their house on a sure foundation. The other builds his house on not so sure a foundation or sand. I believe it's important for me this morning to be crystal clear on the rock in which we build our homes upon. When I was in Ohio, before we moved down here to Florida, I used to be a, a I guess like a custom home builder slash custom remodeler. And we would get we would start out with a set of blueprints or a set of plans from the architect, the engineer. We would take to the we would then take the plans, go to the building site, go over it with the homeowner, um, the person that would like to have the home built, get the exact location if it wasn't already pre-marked by a site layout or surveyor. We would then um, uh, we would then schedule the site crew. Once we would schedule a site crew, then we would clear out the land if it needed to be, or we would um, figure out how we're going to approach or clear the way for the new building. We then would visualize, we would visualize what the building would look like, where it would go, and we would start to get our plan in order. The excavating crew would then be scheduled to come and they would arrive 
and they would do or dig what's called a footer or the beginning part of the foundation for the room addition or for your home. They had to reach a certain point to go below the frost line up north. We don't have one down here where we're at. Um, we don't have a frost line, but we had to make sure that the footing would hit the hardest part of the earth's surface before we laid or poured our foundation. The footing then had to meet a certain criteria of concrete to withstand or withhold the structure in which we were going to put up. Once all this was done and the foundation was laid and the concrete would hit the right thickness or cured the right amount of days, we would then start to build the house. And if the, if the concrete mixture was poor and it was mostly sand or it lacked the hardening agent of the concrete, then surely you would get cracks in your house or in your room addition. And a lot of times those who would build their or would build for people that this would happen, a lot of times they would find themselves in trouble, usually in a, in a court of law. But what I want you to notice here in verse number 24 and 25, that we need to be founded a foundation. And like I said this morning, many of the young people in the world today don't understand what Easter or Resurrection Sunday is really about. They're not founded upon a sure foundation or a rock. And then you wonder why people are running around today and kids are running around and you have the school shootings and you have this disregard for re, or disregard for authority or respect for your elders or different things. You wonder why is because the foundation wasn't laid. There's no foundation. The first thing I want to point out this morning about a foundation is your foundation is there. Now, I'm going to use the term rock because that's the term that Jesus used. I want to use the term rock because I want you to know our rock is there. Our rock is there if you're saved. Turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. First Corinthians 10. Hold your place in Matthew number seven, chapter 7. But I want to show you that the rock, for those who believe, has always been there. And at this time in our history, I don't even want to just say in the United States of America, but history around the world, this defining moment in history where we've seen government shut down or uh, different aspects of the government shut down, where many are forced to stay home and and um, to stay out of the public eye and the social distance and different things. And I want you to notice something, that our rock is there. So if you'll bear with me this morning, I'd like to go through many of the passages of God's Word to lay a very sure foundation in why we believe what we do. Chapter 10, verse number 1, we're going to read the first five verses. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. <clears throat> but with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, I tried to keep this in some type of context, being a Sunday school class more than a sermon, even though I tend to get a bit preachy anyway. Um, I want you to notice a few things out of here. God was with the Israelites when he brought them out of Egypt, and he was the rock or the foundation of their faith as well. See, Christ means Messiah, and the Messiah has always always followed us who believe. But see, in verse number five, there's another set of people. I call them the foolish. The first group is the wise. The second group is the unwise or the foolish, and they did not believe. 
So let's take a, a, a walk through our Bible this morning because I believe it's important that we go through many of the examples that are in God's Word. See, all these things happen for examples for us to apply to our life. So turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter number 13 because I want to go into a little more depth of who this rock actually is. Who this rock actually is. Not sure if we'll go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 or not, but do please hold your place in Matthew chapter 7. Exodus is the second book of the Old Testament, second book of your Bible. Exodus chapter number 13, I just want to show you that the rock went before the Israelites in verse number 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud. We read that in 1 Corinthians 10 to lead them the way, and by night in the pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Hey, the verse that comes to my mind is, the Lord is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know, God has always been there for the believer. And many times he's there for the unbeliever to draw him to Jesus Christ, him or her. And I want you to notice something. Our rock is there. That's the best part about this passage is our rock is there. Just like today when it seems like everything's falling apart, that you can't go to the grocery store and get the basic necessities that you need. Hey, guess what? Our rock is still there leading you, leading you. We just have to remember that our rock is there. Exodus chapter 14, I tried to keep these in somewhat of an order. Order Verse number 21, noticing that our rock is still there. Our rock will also fight for us. Our rock will fight for us. Verse number 21, the Bible reads, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided, and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued. That's just like the world today, when God's constantly meeting your needs because He's the rock of your salvation. He's the foundation of your life. The world, Egyptians or Egypt are always referenced as the world. The world always pursues you to pull you back in. But hey, our our rock is different. Our rock will fight for us. Our foundation will be strong for us and fight for us and meet our needs. See, this is what the Bible says, and went after them in the midst of the sea. Hey, that's the big mistake of the world today is to try to upend the Christian. Even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. Verse 24, and it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of the fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. Hey, when the world comes to trouble you, pray that God troubles them. Pray that God troubles them. Verse 25, though, and took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand over the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea and the sea returned to his strength. When the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Hey, listen to me this morning, Christian. The Lord will fight for you as well. The Lord will fight for you. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saying the Lord, saith the Lord. I will recompense or I will repay. Hey, we don't have to worry about going out and fighting every little thing. We just need to stay true to the plow, stay on our foundation, and let the foundation fight for us this morning. The other thing I want to point out is that our rock is there. Our rock is there. Exodus chapter number 17, Exodus 17. I want you to notice that the rock is there, and our rock will provide. 
you know, our rock will provide starting in verse number one. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and say, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt or the world? And like so many Christians today, we forget that the rock will provide to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And I feel like today in churches, so many people are ready to stone the pastor or the Sunday school teacher because they're they're confused on certain things and they don't realize it's not us, it's us following the Lord and it's the Lord that provides. It's the Lord that fights the battle. It's the Lord that doesn't forsake us. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod, Wherewith thou smotest, smotest the river, take in thy hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. Boy, there's nothing stronger than a rock, right? When you're digging in the dirt, when you're digging with your shovel and you come across a rock, you can't go through the rock. You got to dig around the rock and pull the rock out, right? Isn't it reassuring that God stands before us on the rock because he is the rock? And thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come out of it, that, or and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because the children, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, "Is the Lord among us or not?" Hey, listen here, Christian. The Lord is among us. You know, King David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. You know what? Sometimes we go through things and we can't all, we don't always have the answer. You know, the Bible says sometimes that we should rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. Life is nothing but a bunch of up and downs. But I can guarantee you today, if you're founded on the rock and your foundation is on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have nothing to worry about because your rock is there. Your rock is there. Hey, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 31, because I want to show you something reassuring, because the other side, or the opposite of the rock, here's Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 31, turn right in your Bible, from Exodus, turn right in your Bible from Exodus to Deuteronomy chapter 31, we're going to read one verse out of Deuteronomy 31. One, verse number 30, because I want you to notice our rock is not their rock, the world's rock. Verse number 30, and Moses spake in the ears of all the con congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. Now, verse number 32, give ear, O ye heavens, or I'm sorry, chapter 32, verse 1. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the dew, as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as a small rain upon the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of our Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Our rock is perfect. But I want to show you something. There's another rock or less of a rock that many people are putting their foundation on today. They're not using the rock of our salvation like we are. We're putting our foundation on Jesus Christ, the rock. And they're putting their foundation on their works or other things this morning. And I'll tell you something, that's not going to withstand. Verse number five, they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. 
They are a perverse and crooked generation. Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people, and unwise? What did Jesus say? The unwise builder builds his house upon the sand out of Matthew chapter 7. The unwise, and that's what they're doing. Is not thy father, is not he thy father that hath bought thee? God has bought us. He has paid a price for us. Hath he not made thee and established thee? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee thy elders, and they will tell thee. Hey, the problem today is we're not telling people about the true rock. We're not telling our children. We're not teaching our grandchildren about the true rock. Don't be afraid to speak of your rock, the rock that has met you and delivered you through many of your afflictions. But verse number eight, and the most high divided to the nations their inheritance. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is a lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in a waste, howling wilderness. Hey, I want you to notice something. If you're going to go off into the wilderness of sin and try to build your foundation, just like every desert in the world, you're going to find a lot of sand, aren't you? You're not going to find a lot of rocks in the desert, usually. When I think of a a desert in my mind, I think of the rolling hills of the desert sand. I don't think of a bunch of rocks, even though I'm sure there's rocks and mountains in many of the deserts today. But I believe that they were in a dry, thirsty, forsaken wilderness of sand, building their foundation on the wrong substance. So when the Israelites came across a rock, that rock was to symbolize Jesus Christ, which we read in 1 Corinthians 10, and what we read in um, Exodus as well. Exodus 17, Jesus was that rock. Let's skip down for the sake of time. Um, Verse number 16. Well, let's go 15. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat and art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Now, I've cut for the sake of time part of this this part in half. I want you to notice something. Just like the world today, we've reaped all the good benefits. We've waxed fat off of the abundance of the blessings of God. The, he's allowed us to make a lot of money during the last several years coming out of the last recession. And instead of turning to the rock of our salvation, many people have turned away and they've turned to the sand. And they're not turning to Jesus Christ this morning. They're not turning to the rock. And therefore, verse 16, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Verse 18, of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Listen, we've forgotten God today around the world. We have forgotten the God on this Resurrection Sunday. Who is the rock this Resurrection Sunday? Who is the only one that could pay for our sins? And I want you to know something. I'm going to skip down here before I get to my next point this morning. I want you to see something, and in, in, um, I'm going to skip quite a few. Uh, verse number 31, this is the point I'm trying to make. Verse 31 of Deuteronomy 32, for their rock is not as our rock. For the world's rock, for the false gods, are not the same rock as what I got. We got the rock. They've got a bunch of pebbles. They've got some sand that's being sifted through, that's falling apart. And when the storms come, they're falling apart. Even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me? 
and sealed up among my treasures. To me belong vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, where are their gods, their rock, and whom they trusted? Hey, their rock can't withstand our rock right? Their rock can't go up against our rock because we're founded on the sure foundation and the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice something as I kick into the last 15 minutes of my Sunday school class this morning. I want you to notice something. The third and final point, our rock is strong. And I want you to notice our rock is stronger than what you think. Turn back to Matthew chapter number seven, Matthew chapter number seven. I just want you to know how strong our rock really is. See, a lot of people think of Jesus as this long-haired hippie hanging on a cross that the Catholics have to pull down every mass or massacre and feed him to you. That is not my rock. My rock is a different rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus was a man, a man's man. Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 2. 26. Verse number, well, let's, let's look at verse number 25 again. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. Hey, when the storms come in your life, when the storms come, you better be founded on the rock because Jesus can withstand the storms. He's our greatest example of not falling apart. And if anyone could have or should have fallen apart, it was the Lord Jesus Christ, right? He could have. He could have very easily said, Lord, God, not my will. No, he could have said my will. I'm not going to the cross. And that's what we're celebrating this morning. Not so much the crucifixion of Jesus, but the resurrection of Jesus. I want you to notice something. The best one and the best example of being able to stand against the storms of life is the Lord Jesus Christ. He stood the test of time. Quickly in our Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. Because our, our rock can withstand the storms. Matthew 26, verse number 57. <clears throat> now I want you to notice something. Our rock is strong because our rock stood against persecution. Verse 57, And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled, but Peter followed afar off unto the high priest's palace, and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. Hey, you know what's funny? They didn't even obey the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Jesus endured as the rock of our salvation, the false witness against him. Hey, you know what? When I knock on somebody's door and they say, you know what? I'm just trying to be good. I say, how good? Uh, they say, well, I'm trying to keep the Ten Commandments. And I always say, hey, why don't you name them? And the first thing that comes back is not most, most of them can't name them, but all of them can't keep them. Not everyone can keep the Ten Commandments. Matter of fact, no one can. Don't count on that as your salvation because the religious rulers of the day are breaking the Ten Commandments to lie against our rock. Not only that, to commit murder, to put him to death. Verse 60, but found none, yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? But Jesus held his peace. Why? Because our rock was strong. 
our rock was strong. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is dumb before her shears, he opened not his mouth because he was strong. Jesus was the strongest man to ever live, to ever live. But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of the God. Jesus saith unto them, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. You know, just like with the Israelites, he was in the clouds. And just like for us, he's coming in the clouds again. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further have we of this wit of the witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then they did spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palm of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? And I'll tell you right now, if that would have been me under trial, it would have been hard for me not to swing back or spit back or to curse back because I'm just a man. But I thank God for the rock because he withstood the lies, the mockings, the beatings, the spitting. There's nothing crueler. There's nothing more degrading than spitting on someone. It's wicked. It's wicked. And to beat him. And I believe the Bible, when it says they smote him with the open palms of the hand, the reason why their palms were open is their knuckles probably hurt after they first started to hit him. And so they opened their hands to continue the beating. But you know what? Our rock is not like their rock. He had a mission. The Bible says he was the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Our rock is strong. Our rock is strong. Look at verse number 69. Well, for I'm not going to read this one for the sake of time. This is Peter rejecting Christ as the cock crowed three times. Our rock is our rock was betrayed by his own people. And how many times have we betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ? Lord, Lord, I'm going to do this thing for you. I promise this week, I promise I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I promise I'm going to go to church more. I promise I'm going to read the Bible more. I promise, I promise. And just like Peter, the cock has crowed many times, at least in my life. And if we were honest with ourselves, we would all say we've heard the cock crow more than three times as we've promised never to forsake take him. And yet we do all the time. And Jesus, knowing that we would be weak, that our frame is just dust, he knew this and he still went to the cross because our rock is strong. Stronger than their rock. Stronger than their rock. Chapter number 27. Verse number 11, and Jesus stood before the governor. Now he's against the leadership that controlled Jerusalem at this time. And the governor asked him saying, art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing, nothing, because our rock was strong and he stayed on track. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things these witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly, because anyone and everyone, when they're put on trial, is going to try to plead for their life. They're going to say, No, no, it, it wasn't me. I wasn't there. I didn't do it. Even those that are guilty... And each one of us stands before God today guilty. Guilty. And even in our best condition, we're guilty. I know I'm guilty before God. I know I've been like Peter. Lord, I'm going to do this. I'm going to pass out more Bible tracts. Lord, I'm going to read my Bible more. Lord, I'm going to pray more. I'm going to do this more. I'm going to do that more. And I never do it. And I can hear the cock crow three times. Every time. And Jesus knowing... And the governor knowing, and they marvel greatly, and I marvel greatly that my rock still went to the cross. 
for me. And not only that, he knew he was going to have to go from the beginning and the foundation of time. Our rock wavered not. Verse or chapter 27, verse number 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Hey, you know what I can tell you right now? As they've all died and stood before God, and as they're going to stand before him at the end in the great white throne judgment, hey, they're not going to be mocking at that time, are they? Why? Because the rock's going to be known to everyone at that point. Our rock wavered not before Pilate. Our rock never wavered before the Sanhedrin or the religious leaders of that day. Our rock never wavered when he was betrayed by Peter. And our rock never wavered while he was beat by the Roman soldiers. He never moved. Even when he was spit upon again, verse 30. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head, driving down those thorns into his brow till, till the blood poured down across his face. Verse 31, and after that they had mocked him and they, had, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. You know, and at any time, at any time, Jesus could have stopped this. At any time, Jesus could have spoken one word and threw these guys into hell with their boots on. But he was the rock. And the rock was strong and is strong. And let me tell you something right now. If, I would, have, I would have just turned my back on humanity because it's what we would have deserved. But see, Jesus did not do that. And I can't help but to think, as Jesus then, in the next parts of the Bible, as you flip over, and he's hanging on the cross in verse number 45 of the same chapter, now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land unto the ninth hour. And let me tell you something, it must have been cruel and scary to hang there on an old rugged cross by yourself. And the worst part of all is verse 46, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Lamini, Sabathani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then to be turned, to have his back turned on him by his own father, by God, and not to have the feeling of the Holy Spirit encompassing about him and to be left totally alone, to become sin for you and me and to pay for the penalty on a cruel rugged cross all alone, forsaken, beaten, left by those who were supposed to be looking for his coming. And they left him alone to die alone. And our rock was not moved, not moved. Amen. Our rock stayed strong through it all. And just like when the storms of life come and the rains beat vehemently upon the, our foundation in our house, if we're founded upon the rock, the storm can't take us away. But those who have not built their foundation on the rock and they've built it on the sinking sand, they're unwise and their house will come and it'll fall down and be carried away and fallen away and carried out to the sea. Just like the Egyptians when they tried to cross the sea to come after God's people. Hey, let me tell you something. If you haven't founded your faith, faith upon the rock, you need to this morning. You need to this morning. <clears throat> You need to. Because when the storms come, if you're founded on this rock, when coronavirus comes, when the economy collapses, if it does, or rebounds, or if your health fails and it has nothing to do with this, or when your kids say, I want nothing to do with what you believe, 
If you're founded on the rock, you have somewhere to go. And your house can stay strong. But go to the rock. You know, <clears throat> it was it was in Mark. I would I'm gonna turn there. I don't I didn't really tie this in this part, but um Jesus was was laid in a tomb, and I just I found this ironic. Just turn to Mark Mark fifteen. This is uh, I got I got a couple minutes. Mark fifteen. Um, pastor's given me for the first time in in history uh, as a Sunday school teacher. Pastor's given me the okay. It's probably the only time <laughs> I'll ever get it. But I want you to notice something after Jesus has has died on the cross and he's given up the ghost. Verse 42 of Mark 15, and now when the even was, was come, because it was the preparation that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. I like how he realized what had happened, and this guy came in boldly. And Pilate marveled. If he, if he were already dead and calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph and he bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a sepulcher, which is hewn out of a rock and rolled a stone unto the door of the sepulcher. You know, it's funny. You can't bury the rock in a rock. You can't roll a big enough. You can't roll a big enough stone over the door to contain my rock and my foundation. You can't keep my rock underground. You can't keep my rock away. You can't beat my rock out of me. Because let me tell you something right now. Jesus then raises from the dead. He wasn't contained. He couldn't be held down. He couldn't be held back. And he burst forth. And that's what Resurrection Sunday is all about. And as he burst forth and came from the grave, he's the author and finisher of my faith and my salvation. Because my rock's not like the world's rock. Hey, Buddha's in the grave. Muhammad's in the grave. Everyone who came before and after Jesus is in the grave. But my rock is not under the rock. He is the rock. And we got every reason to be excited today on Resurrection Sunday and to celebrate it with our family. Hey, hey, I don't care what's going on in the world today. I don't care what's falling apart in the world today. I'm going to walk around today with my head held high. Why? Because I'm founded on the rock. And the rock's not in a rock today. He's in heaven today, seated at the right hand of the Father today, making intercession for us for us today. Hey, turn to Hebrews chapter four real quick. Let's just go to Hebrews chapter four real quick. I think I got a couple seconds. I just want to read a few things. Hebrews chapter four, verse number 14. Notice this, the Bible said, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Let us hold fast like we're founded on a rock today. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Hey, I know what it's like to be abandoned. I know what it's like to have the cock crow three times. I know what it's like to be mocked. I know what it's like to be beat. I know what it's like for the world to tear me down. But guess what? He... He took our infirmities, but, in, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. If you're having trouble today, go to your foundation if it's the rock. Hey, and if you don't have the rock and you're on sinking sand and your world's falling apart, you better get the rock. You better get the rock. Guess I've rambled enough this morning. But Resurrection Sunday means a lot more to me because I know Resurrection Sunday was the day that my Savior had victory over death. And because of that, I'm not afraid to die. Because of that, I'm never going to die. I have everlasting life. And it started the minute I put my faith on the rock. 
For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. People boast a lot today about what they have their faith in. Let me tell you something. They've got their faith in a bunch of sand. And when the storms come, we see how the world reacts, running around with a bunch of face masks, buying up all the toilet paper, hoarding up everything because they're not built upon the rock. They're not built upon the rock. He'll supply every one of our needs according to the riches of his mercy. As I was studying this, I was thinking about how many times I've failed God in my life. And I think of how strong he's been. And I thank God my salvation doesn't rest in anything I've done. And I thank God my walk as a Christian doesn't rest on anything I can do or not do. If I cling on to the rock, I cannot fail. And I just want to leave you with something this morning. Grab hold of the rock and don't let go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for everything you've given us. Lord, I don't take any of it for granted. I don't want to, I don't want to wax fat and forget the Lord. Lord, I'm thankful for the many blessings. Lord, me even just being alive today in my mind is a blessing. So many times I've deserved you to take me out early. And rightfully so, I could have never, I could have never said otherwise about it because you are a true and just God. But Lord, I believe as you look through the corridors of time, you can see what each one of us is capable to do if we decide to do it. And many of us you've had patience with and have allowed us to be here at this time in human history. And for a reason. Lord, we may have built our faith upon the rock, but for some reason we then put sand over top of that. And we forget that our rock is there. Lord, wash away the sand of our life so that we may securely and and, and firmly grab hold of you with our life. Lord, I ask that you on this Resurrection Sunday, Lord, give us all a new found zeal for wanting to gather in your place, your house, Lord, when the doors are open again. Not to build a building just for a building's sake or to just gather together and just do events, but that we could draw together and serve you and win this lost and dying world so that they can have a rock to lean on. Lord, I ask that you be with the pastor this morning as he brings the message Lord, that it would strengthen us and edify us, that your Holy Spirit would move and move through him. In Jesus' name, amen.